I can guarantee that you have already seen at least some type declarations containing these angle brackets notations right next to their names. Take the list or map types for example. These angle brackets actually mark a class or a method as being generic. What's the purpose of using generics and how can we use them to better enhance the quality of our code? Well, these are some of the questions we'll cover up today when talking about generics. So without further ado, let's go ahead and roll the intro. Hey, what is going on everyone? I'm Wicked, welcome back to my channel and to the amazing Dart from Novice to Expert complete course. I hope you're having a beautiful day. Here, it is almost 39 degrees Celsius, the air conditioning system struggles to maintain a livable temperature inside, but hey, we've gathered here today to discuss another important and pretty abstract topic of Dart, generics. First and foremost, I want to give a huge shout out to each and every one of you supporting me and this YouTube channel. From now on, you can easily support my work through my brand new dedicated page directly at coffee.com slash let's get wicked. No matter if you just bought me a one-time coffee or any of the awesome monthly official memberships, you deserve to have your name on this shoutout page. And obviously, every membership comes packed with many perks and unique features. You can find all of them by checking out my brand new coffee page. Enough with this, let's get back to our tutorial. Now, from what I remember, I think we first encountered this concept of generic types when we learned about all Dart built-in types a couple of tutorials back, especially when we got into discussing Dart lists, sets, and why not, maps. So, in order to understand generics in detail, let's go ahead and open up the Dart declaration of a list, for example. Here, if we collapse all methods and classes and extend only the list class, we can easily observe that this is an abstract class, an interface containing all method headers you can find inside any list object you create. Now, imagine that most of these methods can be applied to work with different kinds of types, like integers, strings, nums. They are more or less universal. I mean, the first element of a list will always be something generic. It can be an integer, or a string, or a num. So, if Dart didn't offer generics, not only would we have to create a setter and a getter first method for each and every type we have, but we'd also have to create a separate list interface for each and every type. I want you to imagine how horrifying it would have been to re-implement each and every 58 methods from inside the list interface for each and every type you'd have, because, well, lists by nature are built to hold any kind of values and objects. Thankfully, we have generics, and we can set the first element of a list to a generic type named E, as we can observe right here. This way, we can reuse this method hundreds of times, no matter what the type it will hold. It will be universal. This generic type E can be anything, any class, any type you could think of. But one thing to be noted though, is that this E type is actually the same generic type mentioned in the class header. We learned in previous tutorials, and I mentioned it a lot of times, that Dart is a type safe language, meaning that you cannot assign, for example, a string type object to an integer type instance. Lists are no exceptions to this rule. The list class is defined in such a way so that the type safety characteristic of Dart language remains intact, meaning that a list can only hold objects or values of the same type, of the generic type E in our case, mentioned here between angle brackets. What I want you to also realize before we get into practicing with those generic types is that they follow a really important convention from effective Dart and that is how you should actually name them. Everywhere in the Dart API and most of the time in different Dart slash Flutter packages, you'll find various generic types. What's interesting is that they are named by using a single capital letter most of the time. For example, we saw in the case of lists that they use the E type to represent the type of elements a list object can have. 
Therefore, E stands for element type in any collection you'd find. Lists, sets, hash sets, and so on and so forth. If we switch our view to the map implementation, we shall see that due to its nature, a map is a collection containing key value pairs, right? So it makes sense that any of the keys and values can be of any possible type. Therefore, we have two generic types. K stands for key type and V stands for value type. It's that simple. Sometimes you'll also find generic types named using the T letter, which stands for type, or perhaps R, which is less common and stands for the return type of a function or a class method. However, you must understand that sometimes none of these single letters will help you or any other developer looking over your code what the meaning of a generic type is in your implementations. In this case, you're actually free to use any name you'd like for a generic type as long as it provides further explanations to someone that might be reading your code. Also, just a quick reminder, if you find this tutorial really useful and you appreciate the way I teach these concepts, hit that like and subscribe button and consider hitting the notification bell so that you'll know when I post a new video. Having that said, let's get back to our tutorial. So, let's say we want to create a structure that contains exactly three values inside. Most of the time, we call this a tuple. Having this said, we can start coding a new class called tuple and as we said, inside of it, we'll have three values, A, B and C. However, the thing is that, from a formal perspective, we won't want to access the fields by writing tuple.a, .b or .c, because this brings some ambiguity into the game. What is A? Is it the first field? Is it the second one? Nobody knows. What everyone knows though is that inside a tuple there are three elements, the first one, the second one and the third one. Therefore, it makes sense to be able to access them by writing tuple.first.second and that third. What we can do is rename these fields to first, second and third. Or, as we're about to do, make these fields private so that they can't be accessed outside this library and create three getter methods named first, second, and third that will actually return the private A, B, and C values. This way it looks a little bit more neat and structured. Now we have this basic constructor which we can transform into a constant one and I would also like a named constructor called from list that will receive a list as a parameter and will return a tuple with the first three elements of the list. If the length of the list is less than three, then we'll populate the tuple with nulls. This is why our a, b and c private fields are of a nullable integer type right now. As I said multiple times, there's nothing wrong with null and null safety never wanted to prevent null from ever appearing in the code. Null is useful to symbolize the lack of a value. We learned from previous tutorials that inside a named constructor we can assign our private A, B and C fields inside the initializer list. So how can we check if an index of a list exists? Well, there is a trick. We can convert our list to a map which will transform all list indexes into map keys and all list values into, well, the map values. We can then check if the list that as map that contains key 0 to see if our list contains an index 0 with a non-nullable value because this is how we created our list in the first place. And we can observe that we need an if statement for this. However, we learned about the conditional expression in one of the previous tutorials, stating that we can use the question mark symbol to decide what's going to happen if the map contains the key or not. And this is exactly what we're going to do. If it contains the key, then we'll assign the value present at that index in our list. Otherwise, we'll assign it to null. Now, you might have a question in your mind. Wouldn't here be better if we'd assign it to zero instead of null? This way, we could also avoid the nullable integer type of the fields. While this is correct and it could be an alternative, 
Later on, we'd want to modify this class to accept any type to be of a generic E type. So zero wouldn't be an universal option for this behavior. I hope you understand this. You have to agree with me that the syntax looks absolutely beautiful right now. Clean and crisp. What we also want to do right now is to override the plus and minus operators so that we'll be able to add or subtract two tuples altogether, returning another tuple with the sum or difference of all elements one by one. Here, we must make sure we use the exclamation mark to let Dar know that we are 100% sure that none of these values will be null. So, as expected, we shouldn't call this method on tuples that are not 100% populated with integer values in our case. Now, we can create different tuple objects and we'll try to cover every case. I'll create a constant one with the default constructor, then I'll create two others, one created from a list with three elements and one created from a list with only one element. I'll also create a sum tuple containing the sum of the first two tuples. If we go ahead and print the first, second and third fields from each of our tuples, we can notice that everything went just as we have actually planned. This is great news. Now, as you might have already observed, this tuple is kind of an abstract structure, meaning that, well, the three elements inside of it can be of any type. In our case, currently, we are limiting the functionality of our tuple to work just with integer values. But what if we want a tuple containing three string elements or the top three Formula One drivers? This can't be achieved right now because the only values we accept inside the tuple are integer values. Well, in this case, we'd want to make this class kind of universal, more generic, we shall say a class that can accept any type of elements inside of it. In order to do that, we need to make it accept generic types. And since this tuple is more or less a collection of three values, we can name the generic type E from the type of elements inside of it. And now, the refactoring process goes like this. We should search for every type we declared in here that can be of a generic type and replace it. We'll start with the fields, which obviously can be of a generic E type. The list parameter from the named constructor can also be of a generic E type since we want to be able to create a tuple out of any kind of list. But now comes a really important question. We want these plus and minus operators to only work if we have two tuples containing elements of a num type, since, well, only numbers can be added or subtracted. So, how are we going to achieve this? Well, first of all, we must declare that we will return a tuple of num types and that the tuple sent as a parameter to the plus operator should be also a tuple of num type. Let's create two t1 and t2 tuples. Having this said, if we do t1 plus t2 right now, we are sure that the return value of this operation will be a tuple of num and that t2 is surely a tuple of num. The problem now is how we're going to check if the t1 is a tuple of num. Since we can't really control it to make the static analyzer show an error if we call the plus operator on a t1 that's not a tuple of num. Well, a solution I found to this problem is that we can use the is operator to check whether the object calling the plus method, which by the way is represented by the this keyword, is indeed of type tuple of num or not. So, we'll check if this is tuple of num, then return the tuple by adding or subtracting the values appropriately. If it's not, well, we could throw an exception, but in this case, I'm going to keep it as simple as possible and return a 000 default tuple. Now, if we go ahead and run the program, we can see that everything works as expected. We can even create separate tuples of different objects and test their functionality because, well, now our tuple class is a generic class and it can accept elements of any type. Hooray! And one more thing to be taken in mind is that even though you don't have to mention these types all of the time, as they can be easily inferred by Dart, I highly recommend you to always mention them 
it will make your life easier and win you huge amounts of lost tower strength to debug why something related to them isn't properly working. One thing I forgot to mention about this generic type in a class is that we can restrict it to only accept a couple of types rather than every possible type by using the popular extends keyword. So, in our case, if, for example, we'd want this tuple class to permit elements of types num and of those below in the class hierarchy, we can definitely write t extends num. As we learned from previous tutorials, inside the class hierarchy only int and double extend num. Therefore, when instantiating a tuple object, we can only mention numbers inside of it, whether they're of integer, double, or num type. But we can't, for example, use an object or a string, as these are not direct children of the num class in the class hierarchy. I hope you understand the idea here. Now, what piece of advice I can give you in order to practice generic types is to look into all the data structures you can find online and try to implement them inside Dart. All data structures are usually generic, meaning that they need to work with all kinds of types. For example, you can go ahead and implement a stack, a queue, a tree. They will really get your knowledge and brain memory to work in order to understand generics in depth. So, as another example, let's go ahead and implement a stack together. A stack is a LIFO data structure, meaning that the last element that's in will be the first one to be popped out. Let's go ahead and code the stack class directly with the generic type. We'll name it T from the types of elements it accepts. Inside the class, we'll have a final list field of type T, initialized with an empty list. We'll use it as our stack. This field will be private as the stack must not be accessed anywhere outside this class. Then we'll have a method called canPop that will return a boolean value returning whether we can pop an element or not. We will do this by using the isNotEmpty property of a list. So if the list is not empty, then we have at least one element that can be, of course, popped. And since we're talking about popping, let's create a pop method that will return the popped item of type T from the stack. In order to do this, we'll have to store it in a local variable at first, pop it by using the remove last method and then return it out of the function. We can also code the push method, which is going to be a void method that will receive a required parameter of type T and will add it to the stack by using the add method it's that simple. Now, we can create two getters, the peak of the stack, which will return the last elements of the stack, and the length of it. And I think this is pretty much it. Now, thanks to our stack class being a generic one, inside our main function, we can instantiate stack objects that accept all kinds of types and classes. As you can notice, the stack functionality lives up to our expectations. And I have just realized that our canPop method can be easily converted into a getter, so that we won't need to actually call a function when we need to check whether the stack can pop an item or not. Now, I believe everything looks perfect. So having this said, I think this pretty much concludes all I wanted to talk about generics in conjunction with Dart classes. Now, the best thing about generic types is that they can also be used inside functions or inside the methods of a class. So again, in order to understand how we can create a generic method, we need to know what benefits it should bring to the table. Generally, as with generic classes, generic methods make everything more abstract, more universal, more widely compatible, I shall say. Therefore, in order to be able to create them, we shall find an example for a function that can be used to process or manipulate many types of data. Let's proceed with a simple example. Let's say we have a collection, like a list of any type, and we want to retrieve the element at index i and then return it out of the function. If there's no element at that specific index, it will return null, just as we saw. Let's actually create this method as a static method inside an utils new class. This is just for demonstration purposes. So, 
In order to understand how generic methods are different from normal methods, let's just create the functionality of a normal method first. So, we're going to create a method called getItem that will take two arguments, a list of integer and an index that will return a value located at that index if it exists or null if it doesn't. Therefore, the return type will be of an nullable integer. This is pretty standard and should be pretty familiar for you on how you can implement it. We have actually discussed today on how we can do it by using the asMap and contains key methods. If we go right ahead and test it, we can see that it works in both cases. But what happens when you provide a string list to this method? Even though all the method does is to return the element at a specific index, it won't work since the method was designed to accept a list parameter containing only integers. Dart is a type safe language, therefore it won't permit sending another type to the parameter. So, right now, we either create a new method with the same functionality, with the only difference being the change parameter to a list of strings, or we can add some abstraction to this method and make it generic. Of course, code repetition is really bad and should be avoided, since I really think it looks really unprofessional and hard to read. So, the only solution to this problem is to make the method a generic one. To do that, we may want to set a generic t-type to the list, right? Indeed, but then Dart warns us that there is no type named t it can use for this parameter. This is because we also need to annotate this method as being a generic one by using angle brackets and the name of the generic types inside of it. Now, you can use this t-type as a return type, as parameters type and also as local variables inside this method. All we need to do now is to change the return type to a nullable t-type and test our newly revamped method. As you can see, it works perfectly, no matter what list you'll provide as a parameter to the function. And this is where the beauty of generic methods really stands out. Before we sum up this tutorial, I want you to pay attention to this neat difference between generic types and dynamic keyword. You know we previously discussed how we can tell the analyzer to let us set any type of a variable by using the dynamic keyword, right? So then you might ask, what is the difference between writing dynamic here instead of writing a generic t-type? Well, deactivating the analyzer and passing the job to the runtime checker means that the code isn't that safe anymore, right? Any type can slip out here and you'll only see if something breaks only at runtime because there are no checkups at compile time. Whereas with the generic types, everything is statically type safe and any error or warning can be detected before compile time. So you see, the question of when you should use generic types, I must admit is kind of tricky to answer at first. But from my experience, I can give you a piece of advice on when and why you should consider using them. First and foremost, you might want to use generic types when you want to create a special collection or data structure of your own, just like I did with a tuple and stack today. Chances are that the collection you want to create will contain various types of elements, and that's why generic types are a good idea to implement. Why you should use them in this case? Well, because otherwise you'd need to create a separate class for each and every type you'd want your collection to accept, and that would be absolutely terrible, right? Secondly, you might want to use generic types when you feel like some portions of your code are kind of repetitive. When you have a large portion of code sequences that you use multiple times, you should abstract it out in a function. And if you plan on using that function with multiple types of data, then instead of implementing it multiple times for different types, you should take a look into how you can convert it to a generic function to make the most out of it. Last but not least, most of the time you'll find yourself working with generics without even noticing it, like we previously did when we learned the list set and map type. In the tutorials following up next, we'll start working with asynchronous code futures and streams, types that are really, really important to be understood, and frankly, they rely pretty heavily on generic type. For now, it is finally time to end this tutorial on generics inside Dart language. I hope I helped you understand and practice the most important concepts of generics. 
we'll find ourselves having to use them a lot in the following tutorials. So no worries if you didn't understand everything as for today, you'll definitely understand them even more along the road. In the next tutorial, we'll dive into everything you need to know about Dart libraries, as I feel I kinda skipped how private fields and methods from inside classes work, what are the boundaries and features of a Dart library, and why do we use them in the first place. As always, if you like this tutorial, don't forget to smash that like button, subscribe to my channel, and share the video with all of your friends and colleagues in pursuit of top tier development. Until next time, as always, take care, wicked is out, bye bye.